of our festival co-directors Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple, festival producer Sonjoy Roy and all of us at Teamwork Arts, I welcome you back to JLF Houston Virtual Festival in association with the Consul General of India in Houston, Asia Society Texas Center and in print. Our next session is the end of October. Lawrence Wright in conversation with Omar El Akhar. The End of October by celebrated journalist and writer Lawrence Wright is an eerily timed novel on the catastrophic impact of a mysterious virus that ravages the world. Wright is also the author of books such as God Save Texas, A Journey into the Soul of the Lone Star State and the Pulitzer Prize winning novel The Looming Tar, Al-Qaeda and the Road to 9-11. In a conversation with writer Omar El Akhar, he discusses a world which seems no stranger than our reality and the history of viral diseases and its impact on global institutions. Lawrence Wright is an author, screenwriter, playwright, and a staff writer for The New Yorker magazine. At The New Yorker, he published a number of prize-winning articles, including two national magazine awards. Wright is the co-writer of The Siege, starring Denzel Washington, Bruce Willis, and Annette Benning. Lawrence Wright is the author of 10 nonfiction books, including Going Clear, Scientology, Hollywood, and The Prison of Belief, which was a New York Times bestseller and was made into a HBO documentary, winning three Emmys. His book about the rise of Al-Qaeda, The Looming Tar, Al-Qaeda, and The Road to 9-11 was published to immediate and widespread acclaim. It won many awards, including the Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. Wright has published two novels, God's Favorite and the best-selling critically acclaimed The End of October. Omar El Akhar is an author and journalist. The start of his journalism career coincided with the start of the war on terror and over the following decade he reported from Afghanistan and many other locations around the world. His work earned a National Newspaper Award for Investigative Journalism and the Goff Penny Award for Young Journalists. His fiction and nonfiction writing has appeared in The Guardian, Le Monde, and many other newspapers and magazines. His debut novel, American War, is an international bestseller and has been translated into 13 languages. His short story, Government Slots, was selected for the Best Canadian Stories 2020 anthology. His new novel is forthcoming from Knopf. Do follow our handles on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on all our upcoming sessions. In these very unusual times, we have struggled to bring to you JLF Houston without charging a registration fee. We request you all to please donate generously to the festival that will allow the continuous flow of knowledge and information freely and seamlessly. You can do so by logging on to our website, jlflitfest.org slash Houston. Ladies and gentlemen, the end of October. Lawrence Wright in conversation with Omar El Akhar. Over to you, Omar. Thank you so much, Kritika. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, um, I think it's an understatement to say that this year has been uh, full of disappointments, but one of them certainly is... Um, that we're not able to do this in person. Uh, JLF has been one of my favorite festivals over the years. Um, but it is a great honor to be here speaking with a writer whose work has meant a lot to me over the years. Um, I started my career at uh, the Globe and Mail in Canada as a reporter on a 
Monday in 2006, in the summer of 2006. And on that Friday, we had the largest terrorism arrests in Canadian history, the Toronto 18 case. And I spent the next two years of my life covering terrorism. Um, and the book that explained that world to me and put it in, in the clearest terms was by Lawrence Wright, um, The Looming Tower. It was an incredible piece of reporting. Um, it's just a really a pleasure to be with, here with you today. Um, thank you for taking the time. Grateful I am to have the opportunity to talk to you. And uh, I think that we have trod similar paths. And so it's, it's, it's nice to have a, uh, a colleague uh, who has a similar experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk about this book. I want to talk about this novel, um, which I flew through. I, um, I've been hearing rumblings about it with my editor. Um, I think we intersect in, in somewhere in, in the, uh, the publishing world with editors, but um, I, I don't want to go too deep into spoiler territory, but um, there is this scene early on in the book um, where, where there's a description of, of how different viruses attack the body. And, and you talk about Ebola and the means of transmission of Ebola. And how closely they overlap with our human means of compassion and love and how we interact with each other, which I thought was a really moving way to take something that is clearly based on hard research and intersected with something very human and very ephemeral. Um, I just really wanna know how you begin piecing together a book like this, just from a research perspective. I mean, this is, you know, what I got out of it factually is more than I've gotten out of a lot of novels that I've read. I usually turn to the world of fiction for a kind of emotional reality. Yeah. Um, and this just seems like there's a lot of load bearing themes here in terms of research, which I guess shouldn't be surprising based on the kind of work you do, but how do you start with that? You know, you and I have, you know, both written fiction and nonfiction, and I've also written plays and movies. And you know, there's, in, in my opinion, it's all storytelling. Uh, you know, there's, there's fundamentally they're the same project, but there's a difference in the, you know, they have different rules. Uh, but for me, reality is where I always start. I like to know, you know, as a journalist, you ask what happened, and. Uh, as a novelist, at least this kind of novel, you ask what could happen. And it, it's, it's, they're similar, right? Uh, I go out and research. I want to know the world that I'm writing about. And honestly, I, I love research. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I feel thrilled when I get a piece of information I hadn't expected or run into a character that, uh, you know, it just uh, lights up the, you know, the screen, I just, uh, you know, I, to me, that's part of the joy of this profession. But in the case of this book, um, I'm not a scientist, I'm certainly not a doctor. Uh, and, uh, you know, I set it in the world of public health. Well, as a young reporter, I wrote several stories uh, that were set at, at Center for Disease Control when they were investigating disease outbreaks. And I was so impressed with uh, the people that I met. I, I considered them noble in a way. Uh, you know, they were ingenious. They were really courageous and humble. And they just, I thought they were heroic. And uh, so when I started thinking about this, I wanted to, you know, to go into that world more deeply. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, with all the talk about the, you know, prescience and so on about the book. What really surprises me is how lucky I was to interview people who are now, uh, you know, very much in the news. Uh, for instance, the, there were two scientists in particular who, uh, Barney Graham at the uh, NIH uh, and, and uh, Philip Dormitzer at Pfizer, who helped me imagine the virus, they helped me create the imaginary virus. <laughs> and then they helped me cure it. 
Uh, and they're the guys who have designed the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, the number one and two candidates that we'll soon, I hope, be able to put into the arms of Americans and other people around the world. These are the same guys. And I, you know, to me, that's the biggest coincidence is that I had such good fortune uh, to, to work with them. And I found out essentially researchers and scientists like this are puzzle, puzzle addicts. You know, every disease is a mystery, a riddle. And, you know, their job is to, is to solve that riddle. And uh, so I gave them an imaginary riddle and they were very helpful. But uh, now they're, you know, spending their time dealing with the real one. I don't want to get too inside baseball just because, I mean, I, I, I'm a journalist by training. You're obviously an incredible journalist. Um, and so I don't know how much of the audience is going to be interested in this sort of stuff. But I'm just interested in when you're reaching out to somebody like that, when you're reaching out to folks at NIH or at Pfizer, um, is it sort of a, a phone call saying, I mean, I'm sure they know who you are. I'm sure they're familiar with your work. But hey, I'm working on a novel that envisions a new disease. Can you can you help me create it? Is that generally the, the pitch that you're coming in with when you, when you talk to people? You have to kind people? of admit it up front, Omar. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, I'm making this up. You know, I, I need your help. And, uh, uh, you know, they, was, uh, they were willing to sign on, even though they thought, you know, uh, they were humoring me. Um, but the truth is they got hooked on the idea because that's what they think about all the time. And, you know, I think one of the, uh, I mean, it's always a mystery to me why people talk to reporters anyway, but the, uh, this same dynamic holds when, you know, you're asking as just as a writer, uh, people are, you know, suddenly somebody appears in a person's life uh, a scientist or, you know, a submariner or something like that. that uh, and he's interested in, in, in your life and what you do and how, you know, and, uh, and that's a very powerful attractant. Uh, people like to talk about themselves and, 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 you know, what they've given their life to. And, you know, just to be that observer uh, who takes an interest and takes notice and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a kind of romance, I think, uh, because I become enchanted oftentimes with my subjects and the world they inhabit. And uh, I, I think that, you know, they sense that and they, they get some joy out of explaining who they are and why they do what they do. Absolutely. Was there something, I mean, I don't know how much you brought with you to the table when you were starting this out in terms of previous knowledge about this area or uh, preconceptions or something like that. But I'm wondering if there were moments in which um, one of these folks told you something that either you had never expected or that perhaps you had the exact opposite approach going in thinking that, you know, this functioned one way and it turned out it was the exact opposite. How surprising was, was some of the stuff that you were being told? I was constantly, okay, for one thing, Omar, I didn't know anything. <laughs> I had done some stories about, um, you know, e epidemics in the past and the outbreaks of disease, but I was, I'm not, I wouldn't even call myself a science writer, uh, although I have written some uh, articles about science, um, but, you know, there were big things that were surprising. And then there were little things. Um, for instance, I went to Fort Detrick, uh, which is where they used to do the bio warfare. Uh, and, you know, they still do, uh, you know, they, a lot of research on extremely dangerous diseases. You know, they have uh, a level four biocontainment lab where they keep all the, you know, smallpox, Ebola, you know, all the Marburg, all the worst things and you can imagine in the freezers. Uh, and they're constantly working with them. Uh, so, and I had never been in a, uh, in a level four lab, so that was really helpful for me. But a little thing, the director of the lab, Jens Kuhn, fascinating man. Uh, there were two things that I took from that. One was 
he was a vegetarian. Constantly, you know, all day they're experimenting on animals. And it's, it's a horrible process, uh, you know, to sicken and kill uh, animals for the sake of science. And perhaps, you know, one day we'll be free of that necessity. But uh, Jens had decided that, um, you know, if he was going to experiment on animals, he didn't have to eat them. And I, I thought that was an interesting moral turn. And I, I appropriated that for my character. And the other thing is he had an office that was totally bare. It's really odd. I've never been in an office like that. There were no books on his book though. There was a, a laptop on his desk and it was closed. There was one very beautiful photograph and it was of a snapping shrimp. And a uh, snapping shrimp is this creature that that uh, kills its prey by kind of exploding its uh, its shell like that, and it creates a, a like a gunshot of noise. It was, you know, and it stuns its prey. And for whatever reason, Jens loved this, and I found a way to use that in the novel. Uh, you know, you just, you, I guess, when you're going out as a reporter or a novelist, it, you know, in a way. You're 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 covered with glue. <laughs> you everything you know. Your things stick to you because you're on a mission. And uh, and little things like his vegetarianism, but also that picture of the snapping shrimp, uh, planted an idea in my mind. So that's a very journalist thing to do. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of that profile of JFK where the writer notes that the. All the pencils, all the erasers on the ends of the pencils were, were worn down. Uh, the pencil nubs weren't. Um, uh -huh. That description of how somebody sort of fills their professional space or doesn't. Um, there, there's two. I mean, this is this is very unlike a lot of the other work of yours that I've read uh, in some very sort of obvious, you know, uh, superficial ways. Um, but there's two areas where it sort of reminded me of the Looming Tower uh, of all books. And I wanted to ask you about them. And of course, please correct me if I'm way off here, if you think that these similarities don't, or, or if I'm completely off base. But um, the first is just this idea of um, the fog of, of institutional uh, ignorance or institutional incompetence and the very awful things that can marinate in that fog. Um, you know, there's, I'm, I'm thinking here of scenes like when, um, when one of the characters is trying to describe and within the, the halls of American governance, like what we need to do is shut down here and what we need to do, you know, some things that are very, have very real relevance to the moment here and being met with this kind of bafflement of what's going to be there. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm wondering when you look at the present moment, when you look at the way that, I mean, you know, some countries have handled this very, very well. Some countries have handled the coronavirus uh, relatively very well. Um, but the performance here, we're up to, I haven't checked the number, but I think somewhere in the range of 230,000 dead now. Um, just how you think about that notion of systemic failure to deal with an issue like this, um, yeah, having yeah, created it fictionally. It, 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 you, I hadn't really tied it to, to the looming tower, but I think it, that was a, it informed me about how our government uh, fails to work efficiently. And, uh, you know, and it's, it always comes down to people. You know, the, the institutions uh, are, I suppose it works both ways, that institutions form the personalities and, and the personalities change the institutions. But, um, you know, the government in my novel doesn't <laughs> perform very well. And I'm afraid that in many respects that, uh, you know, in real life, it's done even worse than the way I depicted it in the novel. Mm -hmm. So you could say the other, the other thing that it reminded me of was this notion of, of how a country, how a people respond uh, on the other side of a really important, really pivotal moment in history. Um, you know, I was watching this interview where you were talking about this idea of how the United States changed at a very foundational level after the Great Depression, uh, after World War II. And then there's this kind of diminishing returns arc if you look at how the country changed after 9-11. 
Um, and I'm wondering, having written this kind of book and now watching the U.S. in this moment where you have this pandemic, record unemployment, what is your prognosis for how the country changes and what structural ways it changes when we're on the other side of this, of this fairly pivotal moment? Opened a window into the Renaissance, perhaps the greatest, most creative period of human history in many ways, most concentrated in, in its effects and enduring. Um, new thinking arose because the old thinking had so conspicuously failed. Well, maybe, maybe we're in that uh, creative moment. Uh, and as you point out in the Depression, we remade our society. We made it stronger and more compassionate and just. Uh, in World War II, America became the, the greatest economic engine in the history of the world. Uh, but then after 9-11, we invaded Iraq and tortured people in Guantanamo. It's no guarantee that we'll make the right choice. But a pandemic like a depression or a war is a kind of x-ray into society. You see all the broken places. You're aware, I mean, you cannot help but be aware of you know, what the problems are. This election tells me that, you know, that we haven't really made a, a unified choice as a nation. We're still uh, divided. Whether we can make these kinds of big scale changes that I think we need to, starting for instance with healthcare, uh, it's unclear, uh, you know, we know we need it, but whether we can come around and agree how to do it, uh, that's still up in the air. Mm -hmm. I, I have to ask you about this. I'm sure you've been asked about it a million times at this point, but I remember, I mean, I, I wrote a book a few years back, a novel called American War, which is about a second civil war. And um, yeah. I, I started in the summer of 2014. I finished the first draft summer of 2015 and then Three weeks later, Donald Trump announced he was running for president. The novel ends up coming out in April of 2017, four months into the um, the new administration. And suddenly it starts popping up on all these lists of, you know, the first books of the Trump era and the books you need to yeah. read. To and it was infuriating because there was this assumption that I sat down in late November and wrote this thing from scratch. Um, you have a much worse version of that, I would suspect. Right. Um, what is it like to have the um, reality intrude on your fiction when it's supposed to be sort of the other way around? Well, you know, I kind of wrote the book as a cautionary tale for a pandemic that might happen one day. And, uh, and then, you know, the, article, the book came out in April in the heat of this pandemic. And, uh, you know, some people thought I was exploiting the uh, pandemic kind of as you experienced, you know, and it's like, I, you know, uh, there was a, a, a presenter in, in England who uh, was interviewing me about it. He said, well, I suppose no one would pay any attention to this book at all if it weren't for the <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> so, it's like I was, well, you know, maybe you're right. But, uh, you know, I, I don't really advise publishing a book when the bookstores are all closed and the airport newsstands are shut down. Uh, but, uh, you know, there was a sense that it was some sort of sinister publishing plot on my part. And I, I, I assure you, uh, it might have been sinister, but it wasn't, you know, a plot. Um, and I, it's been weird to me, you know, uh, the uh, people talk about the, you know, how I, I, it was like prophecy, which it was not. Uh, the... Um, you know, the fact that the events unrolled as very much as they have in the novel and they correspond with real life, that just came from research. You know, I, I read the, the playbooks and, the, uh, you know, the, all these, uh, uh, I talked to all these experts, you know, who had been spending their whole career thinking about what was going to happen. My question to them was, what would it be like if something like the 1918 flu uh, returned? You know, we would be any better prepared than our ancestors. And I actually structured the flu to be like uh, the 1918 uh, flu. I mean, the reason 
October is referenced in the, the title is that uh, October 1918 is still to this day the most mortal month in American history. More people died in October 1918 than ever had. Uh, and so I, I, it's not surprising to me that there are these profound similarities between what I wrote in the novel and what happened in real life. The, the kinds of coincidences that uh, interest or amuse or surprise me are things like, you know, the president getting monoclonal antibodies. You know, I, I found that, you know, uh, there's even, you know, the fly in the, the vice president's debate, you know, there's a fly in the novel that makes a similar televised appearance. And I, those kinds of things I find uh, eerie and weird. Uh, but these, you know, the similarities between real life uh, events in terms of the pandemic, uh, there's not a coincidence. That's just research. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but but the genesis of the project um, was it? Uh, I understand it was a it was originally uh, not not for a sort of novel project, but a, a screenplay or something like that. Is that is that correct? Yeah, you know, about ten years ago, Ridley Scott, the filmmaker, had asked me to. He had read this since Cormac McCarthy uh, novel, The Road, which is a post-apocalyptic father and son running through, you know, walking through the ruins of civilization. And so Ridley's question to me was, what happened? Because Cormac didn't bother to explain how civilization collapsed. And uh, I have a very interesting question, you know, uh, and how would that happen? Um, I, I thought about a nuclear war, but you know, where are the heroes? And then, you know, I, then I remembered my experience in uh, talking to people in public health and there are heroes everywhere you look. And uh, so I decided I would set it in that world and I would Im imagine a pandemic. Uh, and, you know, because I had written about a uh, swine flu uh, outbreak in 1976, uh, you know, which was a big scare. Um, I thought, you know, something like that that actually happened would be the basis for an interesting book. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's, it's always awkward to ask a writer about this, so please feel free to just not, not answer, but I'm wondering, is it moving back into that world? Is there a chance that we see this in, in um, another medium, TV or film? Well, Ridley's reattached himself as director, <laughs> but I, you know, I've, I've learned in my experience in Hollywood that, uh, you know, uh, don't spend the money until you've eaten the popcorn. So, uh, I, I don't know. I'm happy to be honest that he didn't make it originally because I hadn't solved the story at the time. I hadn't done the research that I needed to do. And um, because I was writing it for Ridley Scott for the movies, it wasn't entirely mine. Uh, and so when I decided to go back to it as a novel, and I, I didn't have to make it uh, movie-esque, uh, you know, I didn't have to have a kind of Indiana Jones figure at the center of it. Uh, I could just, you know, write for, out of my heart. And, uh, you know, and I think that makes it a much better story. And certainly I feel more confident about the research. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about, I mean, I asked you earlier about sort of the research load-bearing beams in the house. Um, but I'm also curious just about, I mean, it's an incredibly suspenseful book and, and the velocity and the pacing is really sort of, like I said, I flew through it. Um, are, when you're structuring that, are you taking the same kind of approach that you do with your research? Are you being sort of meticulous about it, um, particularly in a book that moves around the world the way that, that this one does? I mean, you have, you have this character that's constantly in movement uh, this virus that's constantly in movement, this disease. Um, are you structuring that, you know, if we if we turn the camera around on your laptop right now, are we going to see sort of like a beautiful mind? There's just sort of, you know, walls with lines connecting different plot points, or are you moving into the text and sign, kind of letting serendipity do some of the heavy lifting with, in terms of just how the story is moving along? Well, I like to outline, um, I, you know, I, and then I have, um, you know, I'd like to know where I'm going. 
doesn't have to be, you know, step by step because, you know, you discover things along the way. But, you know, I, I want to have a sense of where I'm headed. And then there are, you know, there, there are templates underneath the story. I, you know, I said that, you know, I, I modeled it some, in some respects on 1918. And I actually created a, a calendar on my computer that was keyed to 1918. The, the, it was set in 2020. Uh, but the, the events in the novel uh, as the virus progressed were pretty much timed to what happened in 1918. And uh, then, you know, there, another template, you know, a kind of classical one is, you know, uh, you, you know, Ulysses trying to get home. Uh, you know, that's, you know, a, the hero is separated from his family and his, his goal is to return. And that's, you know, a big part of the story. Uh, it's one that's been told many times, but, you know, that was uh, a feature of it. And then, you know, there's something about writing a novel, you know, you open up uh, your chest of memories and uh, the experiences that you've had and, and draw upon them. And I'm, I'm in interested, you know, there are things about uh, my character and the things that he does or experiences uh, that came right out of my life. And uh, it partly is just, you know, because it was there and available that I used it. But, you know, there are themes like of religion you know, cults, uh, you know, I had written about Jonestown, which plays a role. I had, uh, after 9-11, I, I went to Saudi Arabia. As, uh, they wouldn't let me in as a reporter, but I got a job as an expat worker uh, mentoring these young reporters at the Saudi Gazette. And uh, one of my first jobs was um, overseeing our coverage of the Hajj. And I couldn't go uh, to Mecca, but I on the phone all day with my young reporters, and uh, they all got sick. And you know that's a characteristic of the the Hajj. People bring diseases from all over the world. Then they concentrate by the million, press together, and pass these diseases around. And then get on airplanes and go back all over the world at one at the same time. And I thought that seemed kind of dangerous. It's uh, not just the Hajj. I mean large gatherings of any sort pose a public health hazard but they just stayed in my mind and uh, so that's you know that became an element in the novel that's interesting you bring that up i mean i, I grew up down the road in qatar um i uh, originally from egypt but I, I lived 11 years in qatar and one year we we went to saudi arabia we went to mecca it wasn't for hajj it was for Al which is like the smaller version that can be done at any point in the year, as opposed to Hajj, which is a specific, specific time. And one of the things I remember, I mean, you talk about this incredible density, it's one of the sort of densest human interactions. But there were also, at certain points in the Hajj, it's a very sort of, um, it's a step-by-step -step process. You do this, you do this, you do the rituals. And I remember seeing a helicopter landing pad and thinking, well, that's a very strange thing to have in this ritual that's, you know, has, has this ancient history behind it. And it was for um, the royal family. It was for when a member of the Saudi royal family wanted to go do this. They wouldn't stand in this mess with the rest of us. They wouldn't be in this. They would land, throw the stones at the, at the depiction of the devil, get back on, get out. And yeah. so... You know, it makes me think of this idea of um, within this thing that's like a pandemic, you're writing about this, which should be a great equalizer. You still have all of these human hierarchies that we've created that make, I mean, even today, the experience of living through lockdown or isolation, if you're a multimillionaire versus if you're someone working two minimum wage jobs, um, that distinction to me seems a very Anthropocene kind of thing that we've taken, we've taken a natural phenomenon, we still managed to build a hierarchy of suffering around that. Um, right. I think I saw traces of that in your work. Yeah, I, I, and, and right now, you know, the ethnic disparities and health outcomes are so shocking. And, 
uh, I've been writing about this for the New Yorker. Um, uh, it's, yeah, unfortunately, sometimes you have these catastrophes that afflict humanity and you see the worst sides of, of our behavior. And, you know, there are so many noble experiences I've observed uh, and wonderful people that I've talked to. On the other hand, you know, all the worst elements of society come up to play as well. And, um, you know, I think, you know, I hope that, I hope that this pandemic becomes a kind of education, uh, not just on who we are, but who we ought to be. Uh, and there's no guarantee that that's the case. And whatever will happen will be ragged and, you know, half assed and, you know, we'll, but a little progress would be some. You know, they often say you should never waste a you know a, a, a disaster. <laughs> so, you know, this is an opportunity to take this catastrophe and 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 make something better of ourselves out of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's been out for a while now. I'm wondering what whether there's been in terms of reaction, reader reaction reaction from the folks that you interviewed for this book. What has surprised you the most in terms of how people read this book and, and what they got out of it? I, you know, I hadn't, I didn't know what to expect when I put it out. I, you know, I'm not known to, as being a novelist. Uh, I, and, and, you know, some of my colleagues were thinking I was wasting my time, you know, and, uh, but, um, I don't know, I felt compelled to write it. So I was really gratified that, you know, that it got the reception that it did. And uh, and a number of people have asked me if I'm gonna do a sequel. And uh, I don't know, you know, I left uh, the, the novel ends with the possibility that uh, it might continue. Um, and I like those kinds of books, you know, where you have characters that move through you know one book after another i guess it goes back to my earliest reading experiences where you know like the hardy boys and, you know, and nancy drew where you you know you'd have the same person uh, and those wonderful o'brien c novels i just loved them so i thought about it uh, and you know it helps to have you know the sense that there would be an audience for it mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about the different sort of, um, for lack of a better phrase, sort of institutional receptacles for your work. You've worked across a whole bunch of different media, um, you know, something like the New Yorker, which has perhaps the strongest fact-checking infrastructure of any publication in this country, and then Hollywood. You know, if I think of the number of films and TV shows I've seen where I thought oh, the screenwriter clearly went to the Wikipedia page for Islam and, yeah. and read the first, you know, three lines. Um, yeah. Do you need to sort of fundamentally change the kind of writer you are or the, or the sort of entry point to the work when you know that you're working for, that you're doing general nonfiction in book form or an article for a magazine or a novel screenplay? Do you change fundamentally your your sort of your arsenal when you're walking into each different fight really omar i don't um i you know as i said i felt like it's all storytelling but you know the kinds of stories that i feel best about telling are the ones that are rooted in reality i uh you know for instance i magical realism has no appeal to me at all i like to have a sense that you know each foot is on firm foundation, every step I make. And even, you know, I've written, um, you know, I, I like, uh, I wrote a play recently uh, about the making of the movie Cleopatra with Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor as the leading figures. It was a lot of fun. I had a wonderful time doing it. And we had a great, uh, we had a performance of it that was, you know, I hope one day this pandemic will let theater come back to life. but. <laughs> Uh, I've researched it, you know, just, I read all the, I, all of Eddie uh, Fisher's memoirs and, you know, the, uh, you know, every one of these, uh, you know, celebrities has been written about extensively. 
And uh, I interviewed uh, some people who had been involved in the production and I just went about it as I would if I were writing a New Yorker story or something. But knowing what happened make, gives me a path through the material. You know, in, in for instance, words, you know, actual language that people use, that, you know, those are very precious to me. And so if you think of the story as being, you know, I'm on this side of the river where I haven't, haven't told the story, but I need to get across the river and the path across the river is what happened. And the leap of imagination is getting from rock to rock to rock, you know? And so if you see that, you know, that's where you're going and whether it's Burton and Taylor or, you know, uh, in, in the case of another play I wrote about the Camp David Accords, you know, Carter, Begin, and Sadat, I have, I have their agenda. I, I know what they, how they met that day. I have their memoirs. I have, you know, all this stuff that I can record. And then I can use it and plow it into a work of imagination. But the imagination is simply to try to surface what must have happened and, uh, and make it as dramatic as possible. Um, so that's the, the process for me. And it's the same process. It's just that, you know, the, with nonfiction, you don't make it up. Uh, but, you know, you know as, as, as well, you know, they, these, I'm always amazed that there are writers of one form or another who don't take advantage of the skills that you acquire in another form. For instance, with movies and plays, there's no narrative. It's all scenes and characters. And so, and those are very powerful tools. So, uh, you know, by writing that, you know, in movies and plays, I learned how to create scenes and characters. And I use that in my nonfiction. But similarly, I know how to research. I know how to go out in the world and, and you know, find out uh, what would really happen? You know, what are people really like in that world? What do they do? And um, and I use that uh, in my in my non I mean, my fiction, whether it's plays or novels or movies. Um, so they they cross fertilize each other, and uh, you know, they're. I wouldn't want to surrender any of those tools because they're all vital in trying to make your storytelling come alive. Mm -hmm. We're coming up to the end of the session. There's just one last question, uh, one quick one that I, I never want to miss a chance to ask a writer, uh, especially now when we're all locked inside and um, can't get out. What are you reading these days? What are you watching? What, uh, what culture has, has moved you recently? Well, there's a, you know, it is such an odd time. Uh, I've been fortunate uh, to have a big project, you know, I'm writing a, a massive piece for the New Yorker on the COVID contagion. And uh, I would go crazy, honestly, Omar, if I didn't have something to do, uh, you know, something to occupy me. And it's been hard as a reporter that I can't travel. But, um, but most of what I've been reading uh, has been research, which is honestly the case most of the time for me. And uh, I've been reading an awful lot of uh, material about, um, you know, the contagion and also about medical science uh, because of this article. I've also, you know, because politics plays a role in this story, I've been reading a lot about the election and about Donald Trump and, you know, all of that. Uh, and uh, I've been, you know, ripping through this stuff. Uh, I. I don't, all, I don't get a lot of time to read for pleasure when I'm in a situation like this. I'm sure you know the experience. You know, you, there are all these novels on my shelf that I look forward to reading, but, um, but then they get pushed aside and, you know, some new uh, expose comes along that is absolutely vital for me to read. Uh, we have, my wife and I have been enjoying some of television, uh, this, uh, this Danish series, a political series called Borgen has been really enjoyable to us. Uh, so we're, we're reading that. And for some reason, my wife has gotten hooked on the, this reality TV alone series where people get dropped off 
in you know nowheresville with you know pocket knives and <laughs> they they're expected to survive uh, you know outlast anybody else on the on the team why she's interested in that is a total mystery to me so we we alternate reality tv with uh, with the television series and the other thing that i'm doing during this period of time i've been working on a musical which uh it's about texas politics and uh that that's been a lot of fun i wish i'd started writing songs when i was your age <laughs> I, what a, what a I, predictable I, career I, arc you've had well as i said it, it, it's basically the same uh people see it as you know wildly different but um but your own example shows that you know it's it's not that unusual. It's just that uh, it's hard to get purchased and taken seriously outside of your zone. And um, you know, it's as if you know Jerry Lee Lewis suddenly decided he he was going to play a little Chopin in a <laughs> concert. I mean, who would want to? I mean, just as curiosity, you might want to go, but nobody would take him seriously. But he might be great at Chopin. <laughs> And uh, so I, I, I just don't, I don't want to be locked into one thing. I, I like to, you know, these ideas for what you do, you know, those are the hardest things to capture. I mean, I'm always in a panic if I fi finish a project and I don't have something new to do because, you know, it's, it, the basic question that a writer asks, I think, is. What should I write about? And um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it, that's the biggest question. You know, there's no help for you either, uh, and, and it's, it's a total mystery to me why I would you know choose one thing or than another. But it comes to you, and you know, you have to be you know like it's ready to get pregnant with this idea, and uh, and but. And I search for them, you know, I, I read and, you know, plow through newspapers, I talk to friends, you know, I, I wear everybody out when I'm trying to find a new project. But then I'll be half awake in the morning and something will roll into my mind and I, with such urgency that I can't deny it. And, you know, then I know that I've got my next project. Lars, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Um, it was really just a, a great pleasure to be able to speak to you. And um, thank you for your work over the years. That's meant a lot to me as a reader and as a journalist. Um, it's just um, really, really good to be able to do this. Um, and with that, I will hand it over uh, back to uh, back to Critic. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Omar, for that incredible conversation. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. We'd like to thank all our official partners for their support towards the festival. Do tune into our next session in the next few minutes. Thank you all once again and hope to see you soon. Hi, today I'm reading from my poem, I Used to Live Here But I. So. I used to live here, but I don't live here anymore. We used to sit on your ugly green couch cuddling, nested together, eating too much. But today you watch TV with someone new. You live among takeout boxes and the clothes I left when I left you. Your kitchen is a hopeless void. She tries to cook for you, but everything is cardboard and gluten-free. Here, you pretend it tastes great. My bruised ego, your rotten conscience. I pause. Starve for refrigerated leftovers. I look for something to eat but all my food is in your kitchen and I'm not hungry anymore. I crave the white lights your roommate loves, nights on my couch and the times you made avocado toast. I took the panda mug, but my Tupperware gathers dust in your cabinets. Open them to smell chicken curry, bacon pasta, reminders of food we used to eat, but we don't eat together anymore. Thank you. <laughs> I would 
call the Jaipur Literature Festival a living library, or perhaps even a library of life. Do join us as we share the excitement of ideas and of debate and dialogue of the adventures of science, of the joys of poetry and music, the consolations of philosophy, the sense of literature and of life. about the festival in India, um, the scale of it, the energy of it, and I just love the fact that there is this effort to bring it to um, other cities in the world. It's a variety of topics, it's meaningful. I'm just excited, I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I've learned a lot, a lot to think about, and I uh, appreciate JLF coming here. Going forward, it would be a, a very good thing to do for the community to have this event on an annual basis. I think that when you hear so many different voices and perspectives about the South Asian diaspora and many other issues, you learn that there's a lot of history that you're not taught every day. Um, and I think that that's important to bring in today's world. I was actually really surprised by the camaraderie I experienced here and the way that People at JLF, both attendees and other panelists, seem to really connect profoundly to literature and care about it. In 2020, our live version of JLF has been laid to waste because of COVID-19. However, nothing's going to stop us from coming in the way of bringing our writers and speakers to you in Boulder, Colorado, Houston, New York, and Toronto, Canada. largest free festival of its kind. With daily interactive sessions, lively debate and dialogue, and international music performances every night, it's no wonder the festival attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. The Jaipur Bookmark, an international B2B event for the publishing industry, happens during the Z Jaipur Literature Festival and sees a confluence of publishers, writers, and literary agents Work Arts, producers of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival have taken the flavor of the festival to international shores with vibrant events in the UK, Australia and the US. Teamwork Arts takes India's artistic diversity to the world with almost 12 festivals of India across continents in a stunning array in over 40 cities. A feast for the senses, these are spectacles of dance, music, cinema, theatre, literature and so much more. 
In each of these places, teamwork arts as colourful festivals of India are the high points of the annual cultural calendars. Be it confluence in Australia, India by the Bay in Hong Kong, India by the Nile in Egypt, Iron India in Chicago, shared history in South Africa, India in the Sunshine City in Zimbabwe, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Kalautsavam in Singapore, Sarang in South Korea, festivals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, Sweden, the list is dizzying. The Jazz India Circuit is an endeavour by Teamwork Arts to spread the word and sound of jazz across the country. The 2017-18 season, four festivals across three cities featuring over 25 stellar artists from India and around the world, including Jojo Mayer and Nerve, drummer-singer Jameson Ross and Dave Weckl, who collaborated with the talented Mohini Day. The Mahindra Kabira Festival celebrates the spirit, lyric and verse of the 15th century mystic poet Kabir in his birthplace, the historic city of Varanasi. Kabir's poetry is about inclusiveness. Mahindra Kabira brings to music lovers an unforgettable experience of listening to leading exponents of the classical Banaras Gharana and rich folk traditions of music on the legendary banks of the mighty river Ganges, along with sessions on art and literature, specially curated walks with famous local residents and delectable local cuisine. Sacred celebrates the spiritual through music and its ability to heal. International artists collaborate with world music exponents from India amongst the most incredible desert settings on the banks of the Pushkar Lake. Heritage walks, meditation, talks and workshops are part of this weekend experience. Teamwork Arts so promotes and recognizes the best of Indian theatre through the Mahindra Excellence in Theatre Awards. The Meta Week in Delhi is an enthralling showcase of the 10 best nominated plays shortlisted from numerous entries received from across the country and across languages. The Meta Lifetime Achievement Award has been presented to leading lights of India's theatre industry. For the young and the young at heart, the Ishara International Puppet Theatre Festival brings local and international performances to audiences across several Indian cities. While the Multi-City Kahani Festival features interactive storytelling sessions and workshops championing the power of imagination, Bollywood Love Story, a musical, our international touring productions such as Bollywood Extravaganza and Flamenco India have sold out shows across Europe, Egypt, Russia and Spain. Expressions International Contemporary Dance Festival showcases Indian and international productions bringing together several dance genres for Indian audiences. Teamwork Arts Celebrating the Arts For more information Visit www.teamworkarts.com